we are talking about the diseases of the bone and the joints so let's have a look at the components of bone first in brief the bone is the heart tissue of the body which is a calcified bone matrix which is containing some cells it's a live tissue so these cells are called as the osteocytes and the osteocytes which are inside are nothing but the transformed osteoblasts in the beginning there is a non mineralized matrix called as the osteoid that is deposited and this osteoid gets converted to bone by mineralization and osteoid is nothing but collagen matrix and the mineral is generally hydroxyapatite and other types of crystals which deposit and sometimes the rate is so fast that the osteocytes get entrapped inside but they form an important plexus inside the bone which allows for extra demineralization processes which may be required under hormonal stimulus at the same time to resorb the bone you have giant cells called as the osteoclasts and these osteoclasts are very important for remodeling so what do you mean by remodeling there is constant turnover of osteoblastic activity and osteoclastic activity leading to constant reformation of the bone now first step which happens is the formation of the osteoid by the osteoblasts which gets deposited by minerals and this whole process will show you an idea of the abnormalities that can happen so what are the components of the bone that you are going to visualize in bone diseases you're going to visualize the bone you're going to visualize the osteoid or the collagen matrix you're going to visualize the calcifications so there are up to a number of lesions that are covered under the topic so you have fibrous dysplasia cherubism paget's disease osteogenesis imperfecta cleidocranial dysplasia mandibulofacial dysostosis pierre robin anomaly marfan syndrome down syndrome and achondroplasia which we will quickly go through in our present lectures fibro osseous lesions are a group of diseases as the name suggests contains a fibrous component and an osseous component and this fibrous and osseous components are interchangeable so when a lesion is predominantly fibrous you will have a radio lucent lesion when it is predominantly osseous you will have a radio opaque lesion that is why most of these fibrosis lesions they have a range of radiographic presentation they may be predominantly radio lucent a mixed variant or a radio opaque variant so let's have a quick look at the classification system description of the individual lesions and conclude the first lecture so the normal bone is replaced by collagen fibers and that is the fibrous part of it and the fibroblast again gets replaced by mineralized tissue which is not only bone but since the head and neck region contains cementoblast they also deposit something like a cementum bone can be further divided into two types as a woven bone and a lamellar bone waldron in 1993 classified the different types of fibrosis lesions he divided the fibrosis lesions into three categories the first category is the fibrous dysplasia which can be a single bone involvement or a multiple bone involvement hence the name monoostotic and polyostotic it can also be a reactive lesion arising in a tooth bearing surface which may be of periodontal ligament origin and these are divided into three cemento osseous dysplasias periapical cemento osseous dysplasia focal cemento osseous dysplasia and florid cemento osseous dysplasia so basically you have to remember one name that is cemento osseous dysplasia there is also a neoplastic component here and the neoplastic component is called as the ossifying fibroma and the aggressive variant of that is the juvenile active ossifying fibroma let's go to the first most important lesion that is fibrous dysplasia described in 1938 by Lichtenstein and Jaffe who described the polyostotic as well as the monoostotic forms this may be associated with various pigmentation defects and associated endocrinal disturbances because of which there are some syndromes that are demonstrated although we don't know exactly the etiopathogenesis but it, there is a genetic basis to this particular lesion earlier it was thought that it was because of an aberrant activity of a bone forming mesenchyme or because of local infections or trauma it has a very peculiar reparative reaction because 
the bone gets arrested in the woven bone stage. Generally, the woven bone gets converted into a lamellar bone, but in this case, it gets arrested in the woven bone stage. There is also a hereditary basis to this particular lesion, as some cases have been reported to have a recessive disorder. Presently, the most accepted reason for fibrous dysplasia is a sporadic mutation of GNAS1 gene located in chromosome number 20. GNAS stands for guanine nucleotide binding protein alpha stimulating activity polypeptide 1, which has its effects in bone formation through the production of cyclic AMP. Now we need to understand how fibrous dysplasia occurs. So we have discussed that it is because of the mutation of GNAS1. Now the GNAS1 can occur at three different stages. So let me demonstrate how it works. So if during a very early multicellular embryonic stage the mutation occurs, that means there is no much differentiation occurred in this particular group of cells. When these differentiate, they form different things in the body. They can form parts of the head, parts of the skin, parts of the endocrinal system, parts of the bone. So when you see such a thing, a mutation in a very early stage, you will have polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. It may be associated with endocrinal dysfunction as well as pigmentary changes. But a much later stage where the embryo has already developed and taken form and then the mutation occurs. Say this is an earlier stage compared to the figure below. The upper one can give rise to, because the pharyngeal arches have not yet formed, so it can give rise to a craniofacial fibrous dysplasia where most of the head and neck bones may be involved. But if it occurs after the pharyngeal arches are formed and then it occurs in a particular location, you can have a monoostotic fibrous dysplasia. So let's have a look at monoostotic fibrous dysplasia, which is the most common. So if you look at this lady here, you can see the swelling is predominantly on the left side of the mandible and there is a disfigurement and a lack of symmetry that you see. The patient doesn't seem to be in pain and that is the actual condition which you will see. It will be associated with pain in later stages when it is impinging on a nerve and associated with the pathological fractures. Jaws and the skull are commonly involved. The other bones that may be involved may be the ribs, femur, tibia and the maxilla also. So if you look at it, there will be a bony heart swelling where the skin doesn't show any sign of inflammation. There doesn't seem to be a gender predilection here and but predominantly occurs in the 10 to 20 years of age. It's a slowly growing lesion which may or may not displace the teeth. Maxilla seems to be more common. You can see that absolutely no inflammation, a bony heart swelling seen both on the buccal segment as well as the palatal segment. The tooth are generally formed, they are not mobile, the fibrous dysplasia does not resolve the bone leading to tooth being lost. Radiographically, as I had described, there are multiple appearances that you will see. Fibrous dysplasia predominantly occurs in the mixed phase where you will see both radiolucent and radioopaque appearances and giving rise to a typical ground glass or frosted glass appearance. Some of us literature may also call it as an orange peel appearance. Now this is an important finding because in ossifying fibroma, which is a neoplasia, neoplasia which is a neoplastic variant of fibrosis lesions, the lesion is very well defined. And here you can see the ground glass appearance in an occlusal radiograph. Another radiograph demonstrating the changes that are seen in the mandible. It may lead to expansion of the lower border of the mandible here. A picture of the maxilla. Ground glass appearance seen in the periapical region. Similar to monostatic fibrous dysplasia, you may also see multiple bones involved. This says that the mutation has occurred much earlier in a multicellular stage. Although uncommon, it Whenever it occurs, it seems to occur in females more likely. Up to 75% of the skeleton may be involved, almost the same areas that monostotic lesion involves. Spine is also commonly involved. Pathologic fracture with pain is more common and there may be, because of the repeated fracture and bending of the bone, there may be a hot key, hockey stick deformity, also called as the shepherd's crook deformity of the femur. 
because of the constant breaking and rejoining the leg length discrepancy may be involved and you may find that the patient walks in with a limp into your clinic the common syndromes associated are the jaffe lichenstein syndrome and the mccune albright syndrome jaffe lichenstein syndrome involves polyostotic fibrous dysplasia with pigmentation mccune albright syndrome is associated with polyostotic fibrous dysplasia with pigmentation and endocrinal disturbances here you can see the cafe au lait spots the typical brown color pigmentation that you see in polyostotic fibrous dysplasia jaffe lichenstein syndrome mccune albright syndrome is also associated with cafe au lait pigmentation along with multiple endocrinopathies these may include accelerated skeletal growth, Cushing syndrome, hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, diabetes mellitus, sexual precocity of in females, gynecomastia. As you can see, all the different endocrine systems are involved. The growth hormone, the adrenal, the thyroid, parathyroid, pancreas, as well as the sex hormones that you see. If you see such a lesion with multiple soft tissue myxomas, that is called as Mazabrod syndrome. So to summarize, Jaffe Lichenstein is polyostotic fibril dysplasia with cafe au lait pigmentation. McCune Albright is polyostotic fibril dysplasia, cafe au lait pigmentation and multiple endocrinopathies. Mazabrod syndrome is polyostotic fibril dysplasia, cafe au lait spots, multiple endocrinopathies may or may not be seen, but multiple soft tissue myxomas will be seen. Histopathologically, there is a fibrous connective tissue with lot of curvilinear coarse trabeculae of woven bone. Because of this abnormal shape of curvilinear pattern, some people call it as the Chinese letter or the alphabet soup pattern. Histopathologically, if you look at the osteocytes, they are lacking in the edge of the bone. So the border of the bone does not show any typical lining. So that is a typical feature of fibrous dysplasia. The osteoblastic rimming is absent. And if you see, the connective tissue is very, very cellular. Here more pictures. You can see there are a lot of osteocytes in between, very close to each other. That is why this is a woven bone. There is a variation, however. In the head and neck region, you may see some trabecular pattern of lamellar bone. It may not be always woven bone. Here you can see multiple lamellar bones formation in the head and neck fibrous dysplasia. There is no particular treatment. It is generally conservative contouring of the bone for aesthetics. There is no medical treatment required and if radiation is given by mistake it may lead to a malignant transformation which accounts for 0.4 to 1 percent of osteosarcoma developing. Facial and the cranial bones in the monoostotic form may be the most likely candidates for malignant transformation. So let's have a look at the counterpart, the fibrosseous neoplasms. The fibrosseous neoplasms include ossifying fibroma and contrary to the fibrous dysplasia, ossifying fibroma is considered to be an odontogenic origin because they found more amount of oxytalan fibers seen in the ossifying fibroma and that oxytalan fibers are considered to be an origin from the periodontal ligament space. So the stark contrast that you will note here is fibrous dysplasia is a genetic disease whereas ossifying fibroma is an odontogenic origin. Fibrous dysplasia is more common in the maxilla, ossifying fibroma may be seen more likely in the mandible. The main fact given by Hamner et al. is that the fibrous component is similar to that of fibrous dysplasia. However, the osseous component contains some cementum like material. This is generally seen in the third to the fourth decade in contrast to fibrous dysplasia which is seen in the second decade. Posterior part of the mandible is more likely to be involved in the premolar molar region. Shows a predominantly female predilection. The large tumors may be slow growing, may be seen 
it may be a painless swelling which is involved in the bone and facial asymmetry will be noted radiographically you can see that this lesion shows a typical radio opaque mark with a surrounding radiolucent area you may appreciate a completely radiolucent lesion also in the figures on the right here you can see a unilocular lesion another unilocular lesion well defined so the very well defined entity that you see here can be actually scooped out very well by the surgeon so generally the surgeon gives us a lesion which is hypovascular and very well demarcated and easily separated from the surrounding bone. When you look at the histopathology, it looks similar to fibrous dysplasia. There may be varying degrees of cellularity with a lot of mineralization that you will see. But the contrasting finding will be these globular masses of calcification which are typically basophilic. These are the cementum-like calcifications. So you can see the calcified structures which are rounded lobulated basophilic masses with a very rich cellular connective tissue matrix trabeculae of osteoid or bone that may vary in size and in this picture you can actually appreciate each of these cementum like material is surrounded by a eosinophilic structure that is the osteoid The treatment is usually excision, ossifying fibroma generally is excised in one piece as demonstrated by the cross specimen. Large lesions may require local resection and you may have to do bone grafting to recontour the shape of the face. Prognosis is excellent and there is no recurrence or malignant transformation that is seen. Fibrous dysplasia has 0 0.4 to 1% malignant transformation rate. So, quick recap, fibrous dysplasia is a genetic disease, maxilla is more common, it's an indefined lesion, gives a ground glass appearance, irregular trabeculae of woven bone is seen which lacks the osteoblastic rimming, fibrous dysplasia has a monostotic, polyostotic craniofacial form and there's a special variant called as cherubism 